I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. You might like to stay to the extent it's there for you, centered in whatever was beneficial that was cultivated during that meditation, uh, letting it continue to ripple inside your body and out into the world. I'd like to talk with you about a topic that is um, very close to me. And it's also, I think, very relevant in the larger context of um, the world in which we live, in which we live with each other. And that's the topic of what I call seeing the whole, being the whole. Um, there's a uh, quotation from George Orwell that I think about, which is essentially, to see what is under one's nose takes a constant struggle. The tendency of the brain is to fixate on one part after another, because that's often what's urgently necessary in harsh uh, survival type conditions in which our ancestors lived and gradually evolved. Um, and I remember talking with Judson Brewer, who's a, a rare combination of a top tier neuroscientist, top tier clinician, psychiatrist, and top tier meditative practitioner. And so we were interviewing him for us and I on our Being Well podcast. You can find that podcast. It's really interesting. He was talking about anxiety framed as a kind of habit, which is very interesting, related to his own research about breaking habits, including habits of drug addiction. And uh, I asked Judd toward the end of it all, given everything he'd known and studied, you know, what did he apply to his own mind from what he'd learned about the meat you know, inside the coconut. And he said, uh, essentially, you know, the movement, the difference between contraction and expansion, including seeing the whole, seeing the whole. And uh, that's from someone who's studied that all very deeply. In my own uh, investigations for the book Neurodharma, I came across a lot of research about the value of seeing the whole. And the difficulty often in doing that. So that's that's our framing here. And to bring it down to earth, think about what it's like when you're talking with somebody and something's bothering you or you, you care about something, something's important to you. And you talk about it. You you know, you take half a minute, you say your bit. Um, it's not perfectly formulated like a legal brief or an engineering uh, description. Uh, it's just real. You probably said kind of five things swirling together that implied the real deep thing that you cared about that a, you know, a reasonable person could have inferred. And what does the other person do? They bloop, fixate on one thing you said or even one word about one of the five things you said and boom, that's what they fixate on. How does that feel? I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> and what's it feel like when, despite your best efforts, they just seem to refuse to see the big picture or what you're trying to talk about in a whole way? Uh, they can't move on from you even saying, hey, I, I understand, I, I said that part, it was a little confusing, here's what I really mean. You know, they're still stuck on the part. What's that feel like? Or what's it feel like if you regard a part of yourself as bad and exile it, disown it, suppress it, dismiss it, push it away. Maybe sweet, vulnerable, yearning, longing, hurting parts pushed away. Or maybe parts of yourself that are actually kind of aggressive and vengeful and can go on the attack, but you don't want to admit it to yourself. What happens then? Not good, right? Not good. 
It's not good when we push away or disown parts of ourselves. Or what happens when we're in situations in which, you know, let's say you've had to live with something, maybe because of a long standing health problem, or maybe you've had to live with something having to do with the ways that society structurally is stacked against you, or people who talk like you or look like you or um, have the skin color you have. Uh, and you've spent years being disappeared in society or aspects of you, your humanity disappeared or your abilities disappeared. Um, and then what happens after all that's been disappeared when you're in conversation with someone and they're talking about a situation and it's clear that this part of the truth of how of what you've had to deal with all these years is just woof not on the table not acknowledged not included not named and in the not naming which is not necessarily malevolent Maybe it's just ignorance on the other person's part, but still, not being named, not having your lived, factually grounded truth brought into the room, um, having it watered down or uh, pushed away as saying, well, that was back in history. This is now when that history, as I think William Faulkner put it, the past is not even past. Um, it's here with us today. When that happens, how does it feel? When an important context, an important background is just disappeared. And then even worse, if you try to bring it up, people get all huffy about it. What, 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 what do you mean? You know, you want special treatment? No, I just want the whole truth to be included here. All the tiles in the mosaic. Right. So I want to talk about seeing the whole in practical ways and explore with you some of the Buddha's wisdom and some brain science, practical brain science, about seeing the whole and being the whole. Um, so here we go. And I'll be paying attention to um, the... Um, the chat and the comments that are coming in the chat and may have a chance to uh, talk with, uh, um, you know, some people here too. So first off, uh, what are the parts that you're leaving out? That's a good question. What do I leave out? What's unsaid? What's left out? Um, when I'm at, working with people clinically, which I, I don't take on new clients, <laughs> Most, most of my clinical practice is in the rearview mirror, but I learned from it. And very often when I was with someone, and still sometimes when I'm with people today, I, I ask myself kind of quietly, what's, what's not in the room? What's left out? What kind of feelings are being left out? Tender feelings, joyful feelings, aggressive feelings, sexual feelings, nasty feelings, wounded feelings. What's left out, right? Who? is left out? That's another really useful question. Who's not in the room? You know, what's the line in Hamilton? In the room where it happens? Who's not in the room? Who's never in the room when it happens? Um, what's left out? So what do we leave out? And there's some things to look at. So we can, we can include what we tend to leave out. And we can include the forces inside us or around us that lead us to leave things out and that are problematic. Uh, you know, um, I think somebody said, uh, let's see, I, I'll find the quotation. Anyway, something along the lines of, um, you know, the amazing thing is that even though we see around us, um, you know, uh, decay and dying and death, uh, somehow we kind of don't believe it'll ever happen to us. <laughs> what do we leave out in that regard? So think about privilege for one. Um, I thought a lot about uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates' definition of privilege as not having to take something into account. And uh, what we can do, though, is we can start to take into account 
what other people have to take into account that we do not have to take into account. And when you feel like you're with someone who's open-minded and interested in learning um, about what you have to take into account that they don't have to take into account, then suddenly you feel safer with that person or at least kind of more hopeful about where that process can go. So paying attention to privilege, that doesn't mean we have to be guilty about it. Privilege is a result of multiple factors, um, luck, um, effort, and advantage that occurs by disadvantaging others. Those are the three kind of main sources of what we end up with, right? Effort, luck of different kinds, including the genetic lottery, and advantage or disadvantage, you know, the deck stacked in our favor or stacked against us. Are we dealing every day with a headwind or a tailwind? Um, those are kind of three major sources, right? Um, certainly we want to do what we can about advantage, but still just in factual terms, we can recognize, oh, for all kinds of reasons, what you don't have to take into account that other people do. So paying attention to privilege. Another is bias. Uh, who among us does not have a bias? Maybe we should have like a big circle, like an Alcoholics Anonymous sort of like, I'm Rick and I'm biased, right? <laughs> we have bias, uh, even implicit bias on a time scale of, you know, fractions of a second. So, but at least we can be unbiased about uh, seeking to understand and regulate our biases. So think about bias. Another one is what's called secondary gain. In other words, does it serve our cause? to downplay or ignore or deny the reality of others we oppose. The facts, the relevant facts that they're dealing with today and the relevant history that has shaped them. Does it serve us? You know, there's a line Upton Sinclair, I think, said, you cannot convince someone of something that it is their paycheck not to believe. Motivated reasoning, secondary gain. Um, you know, what's, what's the payoff? Think about that, you know? Bring it down to earth. Think about people you live with, work with, uh, your family, friends. Huh. What are the rewards for you? What are the bonuses for you? How is life easier for you if you leave certain things out and how you see them? Then there's... I'm going to bust this out here. The great uh, Swiss cognitive psychologist, uh, Jean Piaget, talked about two kinds of learning, assimilation and accommodation. And assimilation is when we take new information and we slot it into a familiar framework. Accommodation is when we change our framework to include something that we've left out that shifts our framework. Accommodation is harder. It's more cognitively demanding. It's scarier because you're shifting your familiar frames. But it's really necessary sometimes to include everything. So paying attention to what we do leave out. Um, you know, for myself, uh, I have been reflecting lately about the ways that uh, many people as we age are dealing with various chronic health problems that are not always immediately visible. You know, in the background, they're dealing with, you know, chronic discomfort or fear of worsening. Uh, they're dealing with a lot of hassles. They have to put a certain amount of effort into certain, you know, healthcare regimes, routines of different kinds, or spend time dealing with doctors and insurance and all the rest of that. You know, they have to deal with that stuff. And it's so easy to just leave it out when I react to, you know, their tone or the fact that they didn't do something or they took a long time to do something. Um, you know, I don't have to deal with what they're dealing with. They're swimming upstream in a way that I'm not. And, you know, it can be really helpful to realize, wow, I am leaving stuff out in my response. I didn't take that into account. So think about that. What can you more take into account uh, in your dealings with others? Another part of it is what can you take into account 
about yourself. One thing I've seen is that for every person who is this annoying, self-centered person who can like is always talking about themselves, wow, I think there are 19 or 99 other people, you among them, uh, me among them, who tend to discount their own suffering. They don't take their own suffering into account. How things are hard right now. You know, they're cold, they're tired, they're staring at financial ruin, they're worried. Um, you know, looking back over the last 20 years or whatever, wow, they, you know, they've been suffering. Uh, recently, I, you know, I was thinking about a thing I have been involved with and realizing, wow, <laughs> for many months there, I, I was kind of suffering in that. That's not a word I normally apply to myself. Wow. So are you taking that into account or leaving it out? Are you taking into account your own good intentions? Are you taking into account and including, not leaving out, some of the longings in your heart? And now is the time to act on them before you don't have any more time at all, right? What can you include more of? How would it serve you to include those things? That's my first headline. My second headline is the process and practice of widening the view, widening the view. Just like when you're a beginning driver, there's a tendency to look right in front of the car. Uh, you know, big picture is to keep looking down the road. Uh, see the whole picture, see it, uh, seeing it unfold, literally living, lifting our gaze to the horizon line, um, does things neurologically that bring us into the present, quiet the inner chatter, and help us see the larger whole, in, in which allows us to take things not so personally in problematic ways. So literally lifting your gaze, seeing the whole room, imagining things from the bird's eye perspective, widening your view. Fantastic. Multiple times a day, widening the view. You know, what's that like? Do you know what that's like to widen your view, to take a bird's eye view, you know, to see the big picture in a situation you're dealing with? That's a good one. And as a part of this, um, think about a key person in your life. And maybe that's uh, bothering you. Uh, you could extend this, if you want, to political figures on the world stage or not. Uh, it's probably easier to do it with someone closer to home, maybe that you're ambivalent about. You like them, but they bother you, or you see their, their stuff. Um, take a moment here, really. And consider that person and just gently inquire inside yourself, huh, what do I tend to not take into account? Or I um, kind of deprioritize it or lessen its significance about that other person. I'll do it with you here for a few moments. And then see what happens inside your being when you just deliberately widen your view about that person to be more inclusive. Doesn't mean you're agreeing with them. Doesn't mean you're waving your rights. You're just seeing the whole of that person. Ah, all the parts, all the layers. Oh. in particular considering things that they have to take into account that you don't, or ways that they're different from you, because we tend to recognize similarities and you know, kind of not recognize differences, especially if they're kind of below the waterline. How does that feel to take that person more fully into account? And can you find the sweet spot with that person in which it's a both and? You both take yourself into account in a centered way, focusing on your own long-term 
self-interest, while also ah, softening um, your positionality, softening your case about them. Just, whoa, what's here? What's all of what's here? What happens then? How might that be a way of relating with that person? Even imagine what it might be like to stay centered in yourself while in effect inviting that person to help me understand, let me know more. What else is, what else is there? What else would you like to say? Um, what else is true for you? In appropriate ways. Imagine how that, that way, that, that inquiry, even if it's unstated, it's just sort of a, an openness in you that you're bringing to the interaction with them, bringing to the table. How might that benefit things? Very often, the least offended person in an interaction is the safest one of all. Undefendedness, in a way, that kind of open, open-hearted inquiry is actually a very strong place to come from. Yeah. And you can see in your own mind um, attempts to uh, kind of deny certain parts of that other person, other aspects, because you don't want to give them an excuse or you're so, you know, hot to trot here that uh, you want to make your case and you've just had it with anything except a point you're banging on. Um, consider that. Consider how that goes. It never goes well for me oh, if I come from that place. Okay. And I want to speak here with some risk about um, responses to responses to responses to the situations in the world today. And we can apply what I'm about to say to many um, conflicts of different kinds between different groups of people. And I want to strongly ask you to not use the chat to um, give people history lessons or to argue your own case. Focus, please, on your own experience and um, so when I think about myself, events in America, involving our uh, fraught history uh, within, with enslavement. I just think about the many times that people seem highly motivated uh, to deny that history or to try to make it seem as if it's just not relevant today when in fact there's a long chain of events through the reconstruction in America, Jim Crow, and definitely still happening today, um, that in including you know the rise of the authoritarian right, a lot fueled by what's called um, white racial resentment, uh, to just sort of push all that away. Wow, you can just see the motivation there. Um, Flip the other, think about other parts of the world. Think about the Middle East right now. And think about, on the one hand, the profoundly understandable uh, reactions of people when, when their part of the truth is not named. Phew. Obviously, it's incredibly important to name, for example, the long, terrible history of anti-Semitism in the world. It's huge. It's 
It's part of the truth. Another part of the truth, you know, is the history of the last 75 years in Palestine. It's part of the truth. I'm not taking sides here. I'm just trying to see the whole, right? Terrible atrocities. They're part of the truth. Civilian casualties in dealing with the source of the atrocities, part of the truth. And watch your mind. Watch the ping pong balls going back and forth sometimes about, um, you know, well, that's part of the truth, but, but my part of the truth. Or, well, yeah, but my part of the truth is justified by this other part of the truth. Or it just goes on and on and on. And, and again, I want to stress, I'm not taking sides. Uh, I'm taking a side for the truth. I'm taking a side for compassion. I'm taking a side for justice. I'm taking a side for um, the greater good um, over the long haul. And you can just watch how quickly the mind goes. Um, you know, I've had a series of interactions related to my talk two weeks ago where people got on my case because I left out one word in an impromptu kind of list of things that we could get angry about you know, or be upset by or understandably react to. Whoa, you left out that word. Okay, yeah, I should have, could have included it, got it, but wow, you know? Or I've gotten responses along the lines of, how dare you talk about X without also naming Y? You know, because it, okay. That's valid because it's X and Y and Z and Q and R and, you know, 194. It's all part of the truth. And then you can just see people that are just fixed on their piece of the truth. And um, there will be no end, you know, to, uh, to wars if we can't find a way to get past that. Um, so I want to just kind of name here uh, you know, the importance of, of seeing the whole, including the history of the whole. Um, you know, you could see the effort, uh, the deliberate efforts of misinformation and disinformation to flood the zone. Uh, that's a football term, but to flood the zone with so much noise that it's hard to see the truth. You know, they throw so many pieces of straw there that you can hardly find the needle of truth in the haystack suddenly because they don't want you to see the truth. They don't want you to know that fact. Right? They want to create doubt about that fact. Think about the history of the tobacco companies in America or the history of the carbon companies in America whose own scientists were actually among the most accurate in the 1970s in predicting the climate catastrophes that we're already experiencing and that are just beginning and will continue to get worse. Um, you know, so when you find people who are really motivated to make it hard to find a relevant part of the whole, that tells you a lot. And it tells you how important it is to respect and honor the people that help us see the whole, including the great teachers throughout history, like the Buddha, whose offerings to us I'm now going to be moving more into. So one of the things that the Buddha taught about is the vital importance of not just seeing things, but seeing the nature of things, the nature of things, the nature of experiences and the nature of material phenomena as um, made of parts that are connected and changing. Those are the three fundamental characteristics, made of parts compounded that are connected, interdependent and changing, impermanence. And thus, uh, form uh, a larger whole that is um, dynamic and evolving. Things occur in relationship to each other, thus empty of essence, solidity, identity, and ownability in an ultimate sense. So when we recognize the nature of things, you know, including the nature of the pronouncements of others, including the nature of the pronouncements of our own minds, right? Um, it helps us lighten up about them. It helps us put them in a larger context. We still have to deal with them, 
They exist. Rocks and water still exist emptily. You know, thoughts and feelings still exist emptily. People say sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Well, actually, words often existing emptily hurt the most of all. So uh, part of seeing the whole is seeing the nature of things. And that's one of the primary core teachings of the Buddha that starts conceptually often and gradually becomes deeper and deeper and deeper. Can you see yourself as a whole person process unfolding emptily? as a local manifestation of reality altogether. Whoa. That's a deep opportunity to, to deepen in your sense of that. Um, and then I, I want to finish here with two additional uh, teachings really from the Buddha about all this. And we can apply it to um, seeing the whole of world events, seeing the whole of our relationships with key people and seeing the whole, you know, for ourselves. Uh, be the whole person you are. I think of Richard Schwartz's material on internal family systems, no bad parts, nothing left out, everything included. We need to regulate parts of ourselves. We need to encourage some. We need to discourage others. We need to feed certain wolves inside ourselves. We need to put some other wolves on a carrot juice diet, carrot juice diet. Um, but all of them are included. And so right there is something really to consider for yourself. What would it be like to include all of you? And what's your intuition tell you about parts of you that could, you know, be given more of a seat at the table? Uh, I kind of visualize like King Arthur's round table, whatever, you know, this like lo this committee of my psyche, like 20 or 20,000, you know, sub personalities. Uh, and, you know, who's, who's not listened to? Who is shunned or suppressed at that table inside you? Who can you include more of? Take a moment here. Let's be quiet for a dozen seconds. What's your intuition tell you? Include me more. Include this more. You might take the form of listen to this part more. It's got something to say. Or it might take the form of honor a particular part more. Appreciate it. Or maybe there's a part that calls for more compassion applied to a part of you. I think of this kind of being whole as a person is both horizontal and vertical. Horizontal is just including all the aspects of yourself and then vertically the layers of them in your psyche, which are typically arranged in terms of time, in terms of your personality development, and then underneath deeply you know, temperament, constitution, and then perhaps really deeply uh, mysterious wellsprings of being even some that seem not entirely your own, living through you. Right? Horizontal and vertical. Is it all included? Is it listened to? Are there parts of you that would be useful to be lived by more? And then also, um, there's a way of being whole in which moment by moment by moment you be your mind as a whole. <clears throat> by mind I mean the totality of consciousness. Awareness and its contents 
occurring moment by moment, it's always there. It's always whole, but we tend to get caught up in the parts of it, this thought about that thing with this feeling and so forth. But with meditative practice and increasingly in life altogether, you can you can abide as the whole process occurring, awareness included. And the sense of ego tends to fall away in that, and the sense of suffering tends to fall away as well, because that way of being brings you right into the present before suffering has a chance to start uh, continually, continuously. And also as you go out into the whole, um, conflicts and a sense of inner division and fragmentation fall away as well. You could try it. This is available to us at any moment because consciousness occurs as a whole, moment after moment, continuously. Be the whole. And then ultimately, um, I named it before, and you, again, I want to name it because I feel like so much of the teachings that I encountered in my early encounters with Buddhism were kind of watered down. Uh, or, you know, they were about interesting things, but they didn't really go after the, the radical roots of um, liberating practice that the Buddha pointed to throughout his teaching career. He went for it continuously. He didn't water anything down. Um, he spoke to people with where they were at, but it was always in a frame of the ultimate liberation of, of the heart. And in that spirit, I just want to, of course, name as well, when we see the whole, we see the whole of our own person process. I've been speaking to that so far. And we see the whole of um, uh, our relationships and other people. I've spoken to that. We even can see the whole of very, very complex, um, bloody history, let's say, in, in the Middle East over the past thousands, really, of years. The whole, we can see the whole that way. And then we can continue to widen our view. We can widen our view to get a sense of Earth as a whole, this very fragile, fragile, rare planet with this thin skin, like roughly five miles high of breathable atmosphere. Whew. After that, you know, we're moving into outer space. Very fragile. You can see that hole. And then we can keep widening out. Um, to get a larger and larger sense of the, you know, large scale passage of time that led us to being here now with tremendous, I mean, for me, gobsmacked with gratitude. Like, wow, no matter how messed up, really, you know, my life's been messed up at times, certainly. No matter how messed up our life is, wow, that the all these things have happened in the universe. So I could have this life here and now. Wow. You know, widening out, and then ultimately realizing, oh, since everything's connected, we literally are in any, just like a particular wave in the ocean at any moment is the entire world girdling ocean acting locally, instantaneously now. In much the same way, each of us is a manifestation of reality acting locally now, here and now, and wow. That's really seeing the whole in a way that can extend into Kensho or Satori or different kinds of non-dual experiences. Wow. That's, that's part of seeing the whole too. Okay. So I see a hand raised. Uh, I want to see if I've gotten into trouble in the chat. Let's see. I'm going to roll through here fairly quickly. Um, I like the quotes. I like the fact that people are staying focused on their personal practice. Very good. I appreciate the examples. You know, clean. Um, great. I'm going to keep going here. Um, I see things. I see things being said. Okay, ongoing focus on seeing the whole. I really appreciate it. Great, great. Seeing the whole, going out to the whole. Very good. Okay, I'm gonna take a chance. 
I'm hoping Mary Lynn that your inquiry is about the whole. Okay, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Um, great, Mary Lynn. Thank you so much, Rick. Um, I've been very moved and uh, inspired by this talk so far. It's really, it touches um, very close to what's going on for me right now. Um, mm -hmm. I've always known, and through your books and through all your talks, I totally recognize that life is all about relationships. Yeah. All about relationships. And and um, people at their deathbed will always be regretful, not so those who are regretful will be talking about relationships and how they didn't love enough, not about how they didn't make enough money. We all know that now, right? Um, and the whole thing of be the change within, like, really mm -hmm. be the change in the world, but yeah, within relationships. So um, I do see the whole. And I remember I did S training too long ago when it was landmark and then S oh, yeah. forum. I did all that. Okay. And I remember they taught us to, when you're looking at somebody, uh, try to also realize the whole room around them yeah. and then the whole globe around them, like that we are humans on this planet. And so I, I've been doing that recently when I'm in conversation with people, I talk to them and then I'm also trying to be aware of the whole room around and then beyond the room and then the city and then the country and then the world. So I've been doing some pretty deep practice lately and, and yeah. it's helped a lot. I'm also doing a journal where I write all my positive experiences each day so that I can focus on the magic of, of my life rather than the sadness. And it's been working. So anyway, I know you've seen me before and I've been really depressed in the past, but unfortunately mm. I was on Ozempic, which caused me major suicidal ideation, by the uh. way. And that's why I've been so, 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 so depressed and, and sad mm. for over a year. But I'm much better now. I've been doing lots of writing. Okay. So That's great. My question. Glad um, for you. And thank you so much. I'm so proud to tell you that I've been doing super yeah. well. And uh, I've been also passing some tests recently, I think. And the tests are to do with relationships. Is there and a question? In, yes, the question that you're getting? Is, yeah, great. When, you, when, you, um, when you're in the presence or when you are in like with someone who is less conscious, like, you know, not, not in a, uh, yeah. uh, arrogant way, but just realizing that they haven't done any of their, they haven't done any spiritual work. They haven't done any, you know, they're just a different kind of person and that's okay. Everybody's in their own place. But when you're in a relationship with somebody like that, um, that you don't see a, a good intention there, you don't see, uh, a willingness, like they're really, remember you mentioned in your talk, like about poking and just sticking to their point and not realizing the bigger picture. Yeah. They're not able or willing to do that at all. Um, but, you know, so I'm sort of at a crossroads right now. I have to make a decision about a friend who has been really, you know, poking the dragon when I was originally offended and then turned, she turned around and made it like, like, I, like I offended her. So yeah, right. Like you're a snowflake not, or something. Yeah. Yeah. So then, I've been uh -huh. just quiet for a couple of weeks, just letting this settle and realizing. Can I jump in? So just in the interest of time. And by the way, you're not rambling. It's just that there's a lot of rich detail in what you're saying. So I'm just for other That's people too. When, when do you separate from somebody who's less conscious, but at the cost of creating separation in the world? This is my concern. I don't want to be cutting people off right, left, and center because they're not as conscious as me or do you know what I mean? Like, so yeah. when do you do that? Is it? Let me, okay. It's good. You see what my <laughs> I, hear, I, I hear you. It is let about me, wholeness. It is let about me jump wholeness. in. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. And, um, mm -hmm. oh yeah, totally, totally. And you can see what I'm doing here. I'm staying in relationship with you while asserting my part, as it were. So that, you know, that's, and you, it's interesting. Um, uh, what do, I'll, I'll kind of share how I am about it, maybe see if it's relevant. For one, uh, I try to see clearly, you know, ultimately I, the Buddha taught ignorance is the deep root of suffering, not seeing, not understanding, delusion. So I try to see people clearly. And over time, as Maya Angelou put it, you know, if they show you who they are, believe them. And people vary in their learning curves. And people vary in kind of the driving motivations behind them. If you want to um, see what people want in a broad fundamental sense, see what they do. Now, I'm using the word want is kind of the net vector sum of all the things and, that are tug and pull at 
at them, but the net vector sum of all those forces pulling away, boom, are revealed in what people think and say, you know, what people say and do. And so if they repeatedly or just seem committed to a certain way of being, and they seem incapable of repair or learning, I try to see that. And then I'm then I'm in the practical of how, while staying inside my lines of character and virtue and practice uh, in, that is rooted both morally and in enlightened self-interest, you know, how can I act in such a way that I reduce the friction? You know, I reduce the impact. Uh, and sometimes I take a stand uh, morally. And I think the issue in the world these days is moral fundamentally. Um, and we need more people to take a specific stand. So notwithstanding my comments about seeing the whole, for me inside that, it doesn't mean false equivalence. When you see the whole, you realize often there is no equivalence between this little minor misdeed and this horrific you know, behavior over here. You know, you under you know you can you can take stands for those things uh, when you see the whole. Um, so that's there for me, and and inside of that, I. It may be that I'm just thinking of how sometimes people tease me, and it's true. They Rick, you see the good in everybody. You know, that's why you get disappointed. No, like you're extremely obviously kind and relational, and you know, self-reflecting and. A lot of people aren't, and just kind of appreciating that um, you can live in your own relatedness and seek out fertile ground. Sometimes we can get caught up in life patterns, including from our childhood, where we're trying to grow roses in a parking lot or you know get blood from that stone. Yeah, and ask ourselves, well, you know, I could put a hundred units of life force into extracting one unit of benefit from this person, or I could put 100 units of life force um, in and give 100 units of life force to these other people who are receptive for it, right? Uh, so there's that part. And um, yeah, I, I also like, I'll finish on Brene Brown's line, write for your fans, not your critics. <laughs> right. Well, I just, my last point, and thank you very much for that, is awesome response and I appreciate it. My only sort of concern still is I, just by cutting people off, I feel like I'm creating separation in the world. Well, are we cutting them off or are we taking a step back or are we ourselves being an expression of the justice of reality with, you know, proportionate consequences? Uh, and, you know, is there's a kind, you know, there's a kind of rough justice that's available in reality where people do certain things and it creates consequences. And sometimes those consequences are we step back from them. And often they don't even realize that that's because of how they were, but sometimes they do. And then there's a chance for learning on their part. And um, so I, I think also it's, it's not that you're creating more separation in the world by stepping back. It's where do you want to expend your life's energy, right? Who do we want to invest in? Uh, where is the receptivity for who we are? Uh, I, yeah. And then how do we do it? Do we do it by scorching the earth on the way out the door? Hopefully not, uh, but yeah. I think there, you're right. I mean, I think there's a way of gracefully sort of stepping back and letting things be and yeah. and moving on and, and investing in, in sort of more fertile ground. So I've been yeah. thinking exactly that. So thank you so much, Rick. It makes total sense. And yeah. I hope that I was on topic with your general topic. Oh, tonight. sure. Yeah. I, really? I think it was relevant. I, I think I see the relevance, but I hope others do too. Oh, well, thank you. You know, yes, definitely. I'll just say last that seeing the whole, it's really one, you know, it's like one of the most useful things I've learned, <laughs> you know? And then as we see the whole, can we bring a tender heart to it? You know, I guess I want to finish with, I think this haiku from Basho, um, you know, I, I'm going to misquote it slightly, but essentially it's along the lines of something like with dew drops, I wish I could wash this perishing world. As we see the whole, 
we can give our heart to it. And may you also give your heart to the whole that is yourself. 